incredible. Every year I've been in Dundee, a church is closed. It's not my fault. But, you know, it's, I mean, it is unbelievable what is going on. Now, my view overall is the church has declined largely not because society has changed, but because the church became liberal in its theology and moved away from the scriptures. And when you move away from the scriptures, why should you even go to church? You've got nothing to give people. You know, so, um, and I'll tell you, one of the ways that works is, we had a man coming here, we did the kids party through there, and he came for his granddaughter, he was an older man, he didn't know who I was. He said, I'm an elder in the church. And I said, oh, that's great. He says, our minister doesn't believe in teaching the Bible. And the people around looked at me and they went, oh, that guy is so dead. <laughs> and I said, to him, really? I said, why not? Oh, it doesn't attract the young people. I said, that's very interesting. I said, because in this church, they do believe in teaching the Bible. At that point, we were only about 100 people. And I said, there's about 70 young people coming to this church. I said, and they teach the Bible for about 30 to 40 minutes in the morning, the same again at night. And he looks at me and says, wow, I just, I just have interest. How many young people go to your church? He said, none. I said, so let me get this straight. Your minister doesn't believe in teaching the Bible because it doesn't attract young people and you haven't got any. And this church does teach the Bible and you've got seven. Can you see my problem? Uh, I think so, yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. So... I think the church in general is being declined because of that. My denomination, the Free Church, is a Presbyterian church, but we suffered a lot, in my view, from legalism. All this is a tendency to move towards liberalism, to react to that, to go to legalism. Um, and two things have happened. The Church of Scotland, more recently, has decided to ordain um, homosexual ministers, and there's been a huge fuss about that. Very interestingly, their General Assembly more or less said, the Bible says that this is wrong, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, and there are some people who just said, we can't live with this anymore. So they've left, or are leaving. In fact, I got one today from Holyrood Abbey, which is a great church in Edinburgh. They're now going to be Holyrood Evangelical Church. They've, been, they've lost their building, fantastic building. They're losing their mats in negotiations to keep the mats, but they won't be allowed to. Um, they're starting over afresh. Philip Hare is there, he's a good guy. And it's tough for him. He's even older than me. And, uh, it's, it's a completely new start. The Free Church, we were a cappella psalm singing only. Strict, confessional, Westminster Confession and so on. Uh, in 2007, I stood up at our General Assembly and said, I no longer accept our position on worship. One of my friends texted that robos commit suicide. Uh, I actually thought I'd lose my job that day. But I could no longer accept the position that to sing hymns or use instrumental music was wrong. Much to my astonishment, the assembly said, okay, let's look at this. So we spent four years, now that's a long time, if you're a Baptist, that's a very long time. If you're a Presbyterian, that is lightning fast. Uh, four years looking at this, and I'll never forget when we, we held a plenary assembly of all the churches, and I, didn't, I did not think at all that this would happen, but it did. Um, we decided that uh, individual free churches, as long as they remain psalm singing, we'd still sing psalms, but individual churches would be allowed to use hymns and musical instruments. And that position changed overnight. We went from a cappella psalm singing, we kind of missed out about 500 years, we just went from that to a full praise band. Um, it was quite a shock to the system. <laughs> Drum, I mean, I've got a professional drummer in my congregation. So. But that has made... The, the free church has changed a lot. We're growing, we're developing. We've got lots of young men coming in. We've renamed our college to Edinburgh Theological Seminary. It's really developed. So I think there's, there's enormous possibilities. We're planning churches. St. Andrews, St. Fernland, Kirkcaldy. Um, I'm very, I've been in the ministry, I know I don't like it, but I've been in the ministry for 27 years and I've never been so encouraged in terms of the denomination. So, if that's what you're asking. Sorry, long answer. Anyone else want to ask anything? I yes. know you spend a lot of time meeting with university, college students. Yes. What does the typical young person, what is he or she raised up with as far as a belief in God, a knowledge of Jesus? Pretty well zero. Uh, there are 35,000 
people under 15 in this city, only 5,000 of whom have any connection whatsoever with any church, and that, by that I'm including Catholic and Catholic schooling. So 98% of young people are growing up without knowing or hearing the gospel. So it's, in some ways, that's horrendous, but in another way, for me it's brilliant, because I go out and do outreach and people have never heard, and it's so amazing. I'll give you one example, I was doing an outreach in a Borders bookstore, and uh, there was a woman came in, and she bought her, at Starbucks, she bought her cappuccino and her Danish whatever, sat down, and then the look in her face of horror as I started speaking, because I had a microphone and so on, there was about 40 people there, and the, my voice boomed out throughout the whole building. She, you could see her going, oh no, a religious me. So she moved herself right into the far, far corner, and... See when someone's trying not to listen to you, that you know that they're listening. It's when congregations are sitting before you pretending to listen that you know that they're probably not. But she was, she was in the corner and she wasn't going to, you know, she wasn't going to leave because she's Scottish and she'd already paid for her stuff. And so she was angry. And by the end of the night, she was like right down in the very front, sitting at my feet. And she said this to me. She said, David, how can you possibly know that God loves you? And I said, that's a great question to end it. So I explained to her about the cross. And what got me was that as she was listening to this, her eyes popped wide, her mouth was like that. And the Christians around her were utterly amazed at her response. And I finished, and she looked at me and she said, David, I'm not saying I believe it, but if that's true, that's the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. And I said to the Christians, See, that's how you should react. We take it for granted. But for her, it was so stunning. And I've seen that. I've seen a woman come in here, and her husband died. She lived in a very poor area of Dundee. She had three teenage kids. She herself had a brain tumor. She kept collapsing. She doesn't want to go to hospital, because what's going to happen to her kids? Everything's a mess. And she, I told her about some stuff. And she started crying. And I said, your life is really, really ugly, isn't it? And she said, yes. I said, what if there could be beautiful? What if there could be beauty? And she said, I don't believe it. And I said, well, I can't make you beautiful. But I know somebody who is beautiful. And who can change everything. And she just, it, for her, it was so astonishing. But another Chinese person came in here. And the very first thing they came to was Christianity Explored. Very first one that we're at, they started crying. I said, why are you crying? What's wrong? And they said, Jesus, he's so beautiful. Because she never heard. And then, you know, now, there's a lot of fierce reaction. There are a lot of people who hate religion and stuff. And I, I, I personally get hate mail every single day from people. So you live with it. But it, it's a great advantage. And it's not just students. I mean, people think we, have, we do have about 70 or 80 students here now. But we have lots of young people who are not students. And actually, we find it much, much difficult to more difficult to reach the older people. Yeah. Younger people, it's a lot easier. Uh, anything else? Probably have been wandering around. Please feel free to wander around the building. I'll, I'll open it upstairs so you can go up there. Take as many photographs as you want. McShane's grade is out there. There are the holes and stuff through there, toilets and so on. That was actually built as a school uh, three years after McShane came here to house 300 male working girls. The girls worked from 8 in the morning till 8 at night, and they went to school afterwards. Mm -hmm. So they could learn to read and write. Um, so, yeah, that's good. What's your name, sir? The young man here. Uh, Walter Okay. Well, how old are you? 10. 10, okay. Well, that's around the age they would be. So, could you imagine you get up to go to work at 8, you're working in a mill, and then when you finish, you come home, you get washed, you get sent out to school for two hours before you go to bed. That's kind of tough there. And that's what they did. Um, just a couple other things to mention. I'll maybe uh, release a copy of this. One of the things, I do a lot of evangelism all over the country, but it's kind of different from maybe what you might perceive evangelism to be. It's what some people call apologetics. I hate the term apologetics. Because it sounds like A, you're saying you're sorry for being a Christian, I'm not. And B, that you've got to be like an Oxford or Harvard professor of physics. And I don't do that. We do what we call public politics. And uh, you start as a 10-year-old, 
you're the key. Because I get far harder questions from 10 year olds from the housing schemes here than I've ever had. I've been interviewed by journalists from the Times and the BBC. I've done university stuff. But these kids have got really <coughs> tough questions. Um, you've heard of the Da Vinci Code and all that rubbish. We did an outreach down in the Dundee Contemporary Arts Centre. 200 people, I couldn't believe this, paid to come and hear us debate at the Da Vinci Centre. I couldn't believe the interest. I thought, maybe there's a door open here. Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The God Delusion. I wrote a response called The Dawkins Letters, um, which is really weird because I'm not a well-known minister or a writer or anything, and this became a bestseller. And as a result, I got invited to loads and loads of universities and secular places, mostly secular places, to discuss this. Um, somebody said to me once, you must hate Richard Dawkins. I said, no, I love him. Then why? I said, because I've got to speak the gospel personally to over 40,000 people who would never come near my church. Never mind the ones who read the book or media stuff. Out of that, a man came in who was the former leader of the Scottish National Party, Gordon Wilson, was converted in this church um, through the book. And he said, I've always wanted an independent Scotland and the Scottish government, but what the message you've got is even more important. But you're rubbish again here. And he said, David, stop running around like a headless chicken. Start training other people to do what you do. And that's what we've done. We set up a thing called Solas Centre for Public Christianity. Um, you could meet the guys who are involved with that. We've had people like Oz Guinness and Ravi Zacharias and others come. Uh, you can meet them, except uh, in the providence of God we were gifted a building to the west of Dundee for one pound a month rent, uh, which is like ten times the size of the facilities we had here for Solace. So uh, those guys are out there. Um, we are so encouraged by the opportunities we get. We get lots of opportunities on secular media. Uh, when I'm done with you guys, I'm just going home to finish an article for the Scotsman newspaper to be published in a couple of weeks' time. Um, we get lots and lots of people who are really curious to come in. We are training. We, we believe our tagline is church-based persuasive evangelism. We think evangelism should be church-based. I'm an evangelist, but I'm a pastor. And I ain't leaving this church. You know, I'm doing evangelism from here. My congregation are very gracious. I, a third of my time I spend doing evangelism elsewhere. We've managed to get an assistant, a guy you may have heard of, called Sinclair Ferguson. Um, he is here as my preaching assistant. He preaches three times a month for me. Um, which is not bad. Great thing about it though, it's back to your question. Our young people haven't a clue who Sinclair Ferguson is. So one of them came up to me one time and said, Hey, the old guy is really good. You better watch your dog. <laughs> So I said, yeah, I know, I've told him everything he knows. <laughs> we produce material like uh, Why I'm Not an Atheist. Uh, that's a great book to give to any of your atheist friends. Uh, there's copies of that at the back. One time, I do, we do a lot of cafe evangelism. I go into cafes and do stuff. Um, I've actually taught some of this in the US because I think it's a great way to reach out to people. Um, and we've got groups in France and elsewhere who've started doing this. Uh, they sat me down one day because I couldn't, they, I, I said I'd write and I never wrote it. And they just interviewed me for two hours and ended up, we ended up with this book on uh, cafe culture and evangelism, using cafe culture to do outreach. And um, then the only other thing in that is there's a guy from Christian Kitchens wrote a book, God is Not Great. Rubbish book because it doesn't deal with God. But here's the thing you keep asking people to believe in Jesus, they haven't a clue who Jesus is. How can they believe? How can they believe? You can't ask people to believe if they don't know. So, I uh, wrote a book in response to Christopher Hitchens, um, which has just come out, Magnificent Obsession. I was really pleased to hear, actually, that Alistair Begg made it uh, his book of the month for me. Uh, and it's just designed to tell